Greetings and welcome to Cyber Focus, your source for international business information. My name is Orly Crows, and our guest today is Dr. Shebanka Koritova. Shebanka holds a degree in modern European and American history from Southampton University, a master's degree from the University of Nebraska, and a PhD from Charles University in Prague. She is currently a professor at Indiana University, where she teaches several popular courses in multidisciplinary fields, including a course on global human trafficking. Shibanka previously spoke with us in May 2013 on the topic of human trafficking and how it impacts businesses, both domestically and abroad. Today, she joins us to discuss how human trafficking has evolved over the recent years and how it can impact businesses looking to expand into the global marketplace. Stepanka, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, I'm really happy to be invited to come and speak here again. Wonderful. To begin with, can you give us an overview of the status of human trafficking and if it has evolved since 2013 when we last spoke? So first of all, I think the, uh, all the public um, media outlets, governments, less so NGO, um, but uh, scholars uh, in the field have redirected their focus on something that I always thought was important and it's the recognition that when we talk about human trafficking we're not talking about sex trafficking but we're talking about many faces of human trafficking and not only trafficking but various degrees of exploitation and so I'm happy to see that the newspaper articles in mainstream media tend to uh, beginning to reflect that um, and that also research has been done in the field other than um, sex trafficking. And, but it's, we still have a long way to go. And I think the main uh, problem is that um, we need to also divert the funding from um, maybe just pouring money onto NGOs who are um, monic uh, panicking morally over the sex traffic and the billions and millions and hundreds of thousands of women being trafficked against their will. Uh, while recognizing that the problem is there, but we need to kind of share the money and fund, uh, funding to do research elsewhere also. And I think really particularly to labor trafficking and which uh, involves women, men, and, and children. And um, so I'm a, I'm a historian and my training is migration historian. And I think the, uh, as I sort of focus on migration um, and sort of read the, what was then modern scholarship in the late 1990s was uh, the sort of the beauty of um, microcosmic or microscopic or micro level research that the macro level uh, research doesn't really give us really uh, I think adequate and um, good information on which we can base policies whether it's governmental or business policies and so these micro level studies based on counties based on um, small sections of countries um, are probably the most useful and give us um, a more accurate picture of what is going on in the field of trafficking and that indeed there are uh, from the one extreme human trafficking to labor abuse on the other side of the spectrum that we need to recognize that we need to maybe alter and change the definition of trafficking and so that's what I think is where uh, the scholarship and from then on the policy makers um, should kind of focus their attention on, the, on these small scale studies and there are actually methodologies that that are developed that will give us a better insight into the workings of trafficking and both the victims and the perpetrators. So, uh, because I'm afraid that uh, calling it this illicit trade that we really can't make an entryway into is kind of a cop-out. And also it 
discredits this whole issue when we talk about millions and then um, when you actually go to the source, um, you really just find out that, dif that various organizations are basically recycling these large numbers and when it actually comes to contact with real victims, that is something, sometimes a very small percentage where you can actually document that you have come across a real victim. Uh, and, you know, by that, I'm definitely not trying to say that trafficking doesn't exist, but we just need to really get down to these small scale studies and research those and that's where the funding should be, like for example Department of Justice in this country and the State Department for various um, international, um, looking at the, in, the international uh, trafficking, I think. You had mentioned the importance of labor trafficking and how that's becoming uh, more included in the discussion. How are businesses today addressing human trafficking? Well, that is a really difficult uh, question to ask, but um, uh, uh, to answer rather. Um, we know that, uh, for example, I'll, I'll give a specific uh, example. There, is, there was a case that is about one year old and maybe it exists, it has, has happened before, uh, where fishermen f uh, traveling from Burma were hired by Thai um, business owners of these fisheries. And so apparently these Burmese uh, workers were literally worked to death and um, then when they actually, some of them died, it was usually tuna fishing. And um, when they fired, they were just thrown overboard and that was it. And it but it was documented. It, uh, the British newspaper Guardian informed about it in a quite detailed. Well, this morning, actually, I had, it's the 27th of March, I had on the news that um, uh, the Associated Press reporter saw these cages and who lived in the cages, not animals, it would have been bad enough, but it was on, off the, on the coast of Indonesia. People were actually locked up in cages and who, um, who were these people? They were Burmese uh, fishermen working probably for Thai uh, tuna business owners. So apparently this, uh, this reporter followed uh, the, uh, the fishermen as they were uh, transported to different pe areas where they were doing the fishing and uh, then found that it was really a forced labor, they called it actually slave lab uh, labor, on, um, uh, there was NPR article this morning. And um, so then they, apparently they informed uh, these big uh, big companies such as Walmart, Kroger and everybody else that sells this tuna. I don't know whether it was frozen or whether it was canned, that what is going on. So we shall have to wait and see how these kind of reports affect uh, the, um, you know, the behavior then of these large corporations because obviously everything is kind of profit driven in the economic world. So how you make the largest profit is when you cut down on the cost and so the Burmese fishermen sometimes pay for the uh, so that they can buy cheap tuna with their lives and so the question is are we going to address that or are we going to kind of perpetuate this situation and this is just one example um, there's plenty of others that I could probably give you involving child labor and if we wanted to be morally panicked about anything, I think that's uh, what we should do. And as consumers, we can make cho choices. Do you think that all the recent pushes for sustainability and ethical sourcing have had an impact on reducing human trafficking? And are there any barriers that still exist? Um, well, yes, because I think until we do what I that initially these really small scale um, studies that really pinpoint exactly what is going on. So we know uh, maybe not the names, but we have the samples and we can really pinpoint, okay, this is, the, uh, this is what is happening. Uh, so before we take those seriously, I think 
there won't be any changes because um, you know we'll, you will. To, to, I think barriers barriers are in the way that we um, uh, as a, as consumers always want to buy cheap things. Unfortunately, a lot of cheap things usually that which is which we the definitely could be a reduction there. Um, and uh, so maybe thinking more in, um, uh, you know, maybe trying to focus on local issues as well. I mean, maybe purchase stuff that are made locally so where we can have maybe a better uh, perspective on what is going on and who is going who's being exploited and why and which is by no way am I suggesting that we should ignore the labor or human rights abuses of these Burmese fishermen or child uh, or children who harvest cocoa beans in Sierra Leone um, and in West Africa generally and you know why the large corporation still using that chocolate, uh, the cocoa rather, to produce chocolate that we very happily just eat. And um, so, you know, it's, it's just the whole uh, cycle that needs to be stopped and maybe the restaurants should decide, okay, we're no longer going to present quote-unquote free chocolate because it's a child labor involved in production of this chocolate with whenever we present a bill to the customer in restaurants. So maybe we could start there. We don't want this chocolate anymore because um, it's upsetting. Mm -hmm. um, how can business leaders positively shape the future of human trafficking? As a business leader, what kind of impact can, can you know, in terms of making decisions, how can they have an impact? Well, they can certainly um, see how, you know, be interested is where the products, how the products are made, uh, looking at the labels, lab labels, looking down the production chain and um, use various techniques to advertise. But, but the problem is, um, I don't know, I probably don't know maybe enough about um, Tom's shoes, but there is a certain, certain ethical consideration going into this, into um, coffee beans, and then advertise it as such. You know, this is a fair trade product, uh, a fair labor product. This product was not made with child labor, and then we as consumers now we have the information, so then we make a choice. I always think about. Um, South Africa and during the time of apartheid uh, that there were a number of countries that simply decided that they're going to boycott anything that comes out of South Africa and I would ho I, I think that it really helped to get rid of apartheid in South Africa so there are definitely methods and definitely those involved that involve business leaders um, in, um, in, in that they have a great impact where they invest invest money and with what companies yeah for a small entrepreneur looking to invest abroad do you have any advice for them in terms of how they can mitigate participating in human trafficking well again you know that would be a very kind of naive suggestion but do research first investigate um, who you have the that, that is going to be working for you, and um, it's it, it's really hard because, as I said, you know the profit is kind of rules and determines our activities. So uh, I don't want to ever again sort of throw arms in the air and say, well, nothing can be done about it. But I believe that uh, things are changing, and uh, uh, so people are, I think, much more aware of things happening with the climate, with access to drinking water, that resources are limited. So maybe we should also think about, you know, how we treat the human beings that we want to employ and, uh, you know, with respect, with, you know, think about human rights. But I know that that's going to be just one, one story, but there's going to be other considerations. 
What are some of the local actions that students or consumers um, can take on right now to eliminate human trafficking? Well, again, maybe not eliminate the human trafficking, but again, the spectrum from um, uh, that I was talking about that you know, there's, it's, the issue is not black and white, human trafficking or not human trafficking, but there's human trafficking and there is also labor abuse. And so what, we, uh, what I have been doing with uh, my students in a service learning class, that, I mean in the global human trafficking class, in, we have a service learning initiative where we partnered with Human Rights Commission in Bloomington and uh, we put together a certificate and talking points and basically what ha what is happening is that the students and now students with partnering with the members of the Human Rights Commission go around uh, restaurants in Bloomington and they talk to the best to them to the restaurant owners and basically asking them do you uphold um, Department of Labor mandated uh, labor practices. And if they do, uh, they sign the certificate and then they get a decal on their door, which is quite pretty. And hopefully again, uh, through social media, students will spread the word. And um, because I think what I, I never mentioned in during all this conversation, the vulnerable population, which is actually students, is a vulnerable, they are vulnerable population, they need to work and they can sometimes be taken advantage of and they can be US citizens but still uh, experience issues like wage theft. But also the other probably most vulnerable population which are the undocumented that is um, they're very vulnerable. So that's, this is what can be done and I hope it makes some, we'll, we're making a change. Thank you so much. What an exciting initiative. I'm going to definitely be on the lookout for the decals when I go to the Bloomington businesses soon enough. Um, thank you so much for your time today. It was lovely speaking with you. Oh, thank you for your questions, and I was very happy to be here. Wonderful. That's all for this edition of Cyber Focus. If you have any comments or suggestions for future topics or guests, please contact us at cyber at indiana.edu.